Hello, this is Father Carlos Cepeda, and today we're bringing back this video, an oldie, that was made by fathers, the fathers Dominic and Francisco Radecki. It's a very good explanation of Vatican II. We have uh, restored it, digitized it, uh, restored the audio a little bit. And we want to exhort you, we got the permission from them to, to put this video online. I don't know if everybody that has put it in there has the permission from them. We do. Uh, we exhort you to go visit their website, the library where they sell, they don't sell that video anymore because it's old. You'll see the quality is, you know, from, from the 1980s, maybe 1990s. Uh, but it's a very good video still. Go check out stjosephsmedia.com, that's their website. This is the first, the first book that they made on the topic. They collected all their articles and they made this book. I'm not sure if this one is on sale. But after this one, they came up with uh, this one, which is a more complete exposition of it. And this one is actually very good. It has first the 20, the 20 councils of the church, and then it goes into the Second Vatican Council, and it explains a lot of what happened there. Very, very good book. But their latest production is this one over here, Vatican II Exposed as Counterfeit Catholicism. It's a very good book. As you can see, it's quite big. And it's a full reference of everything that happened in Vatican II, who were the people involved, all those things. So visit St. Joseph's Media to check it out. And now let's go see The Vacancy, directed by Father Radecki. Thank you. God bless you. The Church, one, holy, Catholic, apostolic. Unified and securely bounded by the eternal truth of Jesus Christ. Consistently resistant to the temptations of the world and the devil. Always nurturing the good in mankind and unfailingly condemning evil. Universal in its worldwide dominion of human souls, leading the way along the one true path to salvation and eternal life. From its divine institution by God through the apostles and continuing down the centuries under the infallible leadership of the popes, the vicars of Christ on earth, lineal descendants of St. Peter, the Catholic Church, a lighthouse illuminating the sure path to God, a rock unshakable in upholding God's law, a fount of eternal and divine wisdom and beauty. A bastion of divine light and heavenly glory. A moral barometer for believer and unbeliever. The church serenely leading the souls of mankind through the darkness of ignorance into the light of civilization and human progress. The Catholic Church, secure in the divine promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. But suddenly, in the early 1960s, the greatest war in the history of the universe began. It is a war not of man against man. It is a war between God and the devil at stake in this war are millions of human souls. The battleground is the Catholic Church itself. The opening salvo was fired by the devil when John the 23rd was inspired to call the Second Vatican Council. He said he wanted to open the doors and windows of the church. He evidently meant that he wanted to make the church more relevant, to modernize it. Some of the church fathers said they wanted to bring the religion to the people. It was decided that the ancient liturgy instituted by Christ himself should be reformed so the people could better understand it. Of course, no one asked the people what they thought. Willy-nilly, in 1962, 
with the advent of the Second Vatican Council, an all-out attack from within and without was launched against the Catholic Church. The result, for Catholics, has been spiritual agony and moral chaos. Hello, my name is Richard Jameson. I'm a Roman Catholic layman. I'm 50 years old. I've been a Catholic all my life. When the changes decreed by Vatican II began, I obediently tried to accept them, and to an extent, I succeeded. I didn't stop supporting my parish. I continued to go to church. And change by change, desecration by desecration, I sat there and watched my church crumble into ruins. At the first changes, I was irritated, sometimes kind of amused at the silliness of them, but, but gradually irritation turned to anger, and then finally I began to fear. I became afraid for my because the church I was in no longer looked Catholic to me. Now, I'm a Catholic. My first responsibility is the salvation of my soul, and as a Catholic, I can't save my soul in a non-Catholic church. So I began to do some research. I looked some things up. And I discovered some amazing facts. I came to some conclusions. So the purpose of this tape is to share those facts and those conclusions with you. Uh, again, I will say to you, my name is Richard Jameson. I only introduce myself because uh, you have a right to know who's talking to you. I'm not an anonymous narrator. Um, I should tell you that I do make some personal assumptions about you, even though this is not a personal testimonial for me. Uh, I assume that where you're concerned, you're a Catholic who's in a Vatican II church, and you're very uncomfortable with it. If you're the kind of obedient Catholic who doesn't ask questions, then you're having a real hard time accepting the unacceptable. If you're the kind that does ask questions, then you've been getting some very fuzzy answers. Well, I can't give you the, the entire 30-year history of Vatican II on a tape like this, but I can highlight for you, I think, what was done, uh, how it was done, and why we think it was done. First of all, I have to tell you, you've been lied to. The entire history of Vatican II is filled with falsehood and deceit. Now, on this tape, I'm going to endeavor to tell you only the truth. The trouble is that if you've been accepting lies and half-truths for a long time, for many years, as I did, then when you finally hear the truth, you may find it shocking, even offensive. I can't help that. I can only ask that you watch the tape all the way through before you accept or reject anything that I say. And also, I would suggest that whatever you might end up thinking of me or the things I say, you substantiate them for yourself. Do a little research on your own. There'll be a reading list at the end of this tape. Um, it's a suggested reading list, and it's nowhere anywhere near all conclusive, but it'll get you started. So, what was done? Well, I'll begin at the beginning. The first thing that was done at Vatican II was the Reformation of the Liturgy. This, of course, meant a complete rewrite of the Latin Mass, the Tridentine Mass, the traditional Mass. The Latin Mass, promulgated by St. Pius V at the Council of Trent, is the embodiment of the entire Catholic religion. Replace it, and you have a new religion. The so-called new Mass is, at best, a Christian social club meeting. Um, but at worst, sometimes, it's a bad piece of stand-up comedy performed by a fool in a clown suit. Now, the perpetual Mass embodies the entire theology of Jesus Christ, and therefore the entire theology of the Catholic Church. Change it. New Mass, you get a new church. Every past Reformation was accomplished just this way. Thomas Cranmer rewrote it for Henry VIII. Martin Luther rewrote the Mass for himself. And presto, you had an Anglican and a Lutheran church. The Anglican Reformation is especially interesting in light of Vatican II. 
they kept the same church buildings and the same priests, but they changed the Mass. Does that sound kind of familiar? I've been calling it the Mass, but properly speaking, it's the holy sacrifice of the Mass, isn't it? And that's the crux of the whole matter. That's what it's all about. That's the hard part. We all have trouble with that, this, this fear of, of sacrifice. Bishop Sheen called that fear of sacrifice fear of the cross. I mean, we're frail human beings, and sacrifices, even small ones, it can be painful, and we all fear them. It is the concept of sacrifice which has been removed from the Novus Ordo Mass, the new Mass, thereby creating a non-Catholic church. You see, that's the difference between uh, Protestant and Catholic. Catholic doctrine says that when Jesus died on the cross, he did indeed die for all of us. That is, those of us who can take up our crosses and follow him just as he demands that we do. Now, that's Catholic doctrine. Each person's first responsibility must be the salvation of his own soul, and that's accomplished by us through sacrifice for the sake of Christ. And it must be done, or we're not saved. Now, that's clear in Scripture and in doctrine, not because the Catholic Church invented it, but because it's what God demands, sacrifice. Now, Protestant interpretation of Scripture is somewhat different, significantly different. It says that when Jesus died, he automatically saved us all, once and for all. All we have to do is believe, and we're saved, even if we never make a sacrifice in our life, even if we never do any good works. Well, that's nice. Certainly an easier path to salvation. That's always been the attraction of the Reformers. It's easier. The only trouble with it is that that concept isn't Jesus Christ. It's Martin Luther's. It is an error. So sadly, the new Mass isn't a Mass at all. It's a memorial meal in honor of a famous person named Jesus Christ. The people, the priest faces the people. Uh, everything in it's in English. The priest and the people ad lib. Vocal calisthenics. You, you hold hands at the Lord's Prayer. It goes on and on and on. And it's often very different from parish to parish. Um, <laughs> the variations on some of these, these strange liturgies from one church to another have resulted in some amazing performances. I mean, there have been balloon masses and clown masses and puppet masses and dance masses, movies, skits and slideshows. It goes on and on. I'm not going to go on about them. You've probably seen a lot of them for yourself. Now, you may have been telling yourself, as I did for many years, that these offensive performances uh, were just the externals of the Mass, and uh, the important parts of it, the spiritual part, the internal part of it, the, the, the important parts hadn't changed. After all, it was just a translation of the original Mass, so you had to put up with this no matter how offensive the performance was. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The new Mass is an entire rewrite. It is not a translation. It's a complete rewrite. It's indeed completely new. And you can prove that for yourself. You don't have to do a lot of research for this. You can prove that for yourself just by getting out your old Roman Missal, if you still have one, and comparing it to the Novus Ordo Missalette. Look at the translation of the original Mass. Look at the Missalette. You'll see the differences right away. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on, on most of the differences. I'm going to highlight a couple of them, and then we'll come to the really important one. But first of all, there's communion in the hand, all right? Now, that's a Protestant practice, has been for a long time. But Vatican II went to Protestants one better. Even Protestants don't normally have lay people distribute communion. The offertory is now called the preparation of the gifts. Martin Luther called the offertory an abomination. He hated it. Well, he'd love it now. Everything in the offertory pertaining to, to true Catholic doctrine or belief is gone. But then again, he might not like it so much. The uh, beginning of the offertory... Uh, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. That actually comes from a Jewish grace before meals. Uh, all in all, the new Mass suppresses everything that a non-Catholic could object to. Catholic concepts like sin, God's majesty, obedience to his commandments, uh, eternity, uh, heaven. The list goes on and on. The Novus Ordo Protestant ceremony doesn't mention grace even once. Now, that's amazing. In the original Mass, grace is mentioned 11 times. 
Amazingly, grace is gone without a trace. All of these changes contributed to the destruction of the mass. But the key lies in what was done to the canon of the mass. Now, in Catholic belief, the changing of bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ is both a miracle and a mystery. A Catholic believes, he must believe, that when Jesus said, this is my body, he really meant it. He didn't say, this symbolizes my body. He said, this is. So even though this is a mystery to us, I mean, after all, it still looks like bread and wine, because we believe that Christ is God, we believe him. We believe that when he said, this is my body, it really, literally, is his body. In other words, we have faith in him and in what he says. Now, that's the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation that I just described, the changing of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, even though it still looks like bread and wine. The fact that the bread and wine have literally become the body and blood of Jesus Christ is usually referred to as the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, the keystone of Catholicism is the Mass. The center of the Mass is the canon, and the keystone of the canon is the consecration, and the consecration has been destroyed by Vatican II. In the new Mass, there is no canon, properly speaking. There's a choice of four Eucharistic prayers. Three of them are uh, so ridiculous, I'm not even going to talk about them. But Eucharistic prayer number one is a very bad, mistranslated version of the original canon of the Mass, so that's what I'm going to use for, for my comparison here. In the original Mass, at the consecration, the priest says, this is my body. Now, at this moment, the bread has become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, a few minutes later, he says, this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. Now the wine is the body, blood, soul, and divinity. In the Novus Ordo Missalette, it says, this is my body, which will be given up for you, and this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. They're not errors in translation. They are deliberately destructive changes which invalidate the sacrament of the Eucharist. The new Mass deletes the phrase, the mystery of faith, and changes the word many to all. Could it be that if there is no mysterious faith in the miracle, then the miracle doesn't happen? Is transubstantiation no more? Could it be that uh, the sacrifice of the Mass isn't a sacrifice at all, but only a memorial meal in which a, a lot of nice people sit around, hold hands, and lift a glass of wine, have a piece of bread in memory of their old friend Jesus? Well, if that's the case, then you're not in a Catholic church. We're going to come back to the mystery of faith in a minute, but I want to look at the other change first. Many to all. Now, that change throws 90% of all Catholic doctrine right out the window. All Catholic teaching out. If all are saved by the Lord's sacrifice alone, the church is no longer Catholic. Well, now I practically hear you saying, but what about faith? After all, the words are only words. What about my belief? If I believe and the priest believes that the bread and wine have become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, well, then they have, regardless of the words. Well, first of all, that's a little piece of egotism that Jesus doesn't allow you. And if the words weren't important, why didn't he say uh, abracadabra or eureka? He demands that certain words be said in a certain way. The priest has to say those words. For the miracle of the Eucharist to happen, the rite has to be followed exactly. Not only because the church says so, but because Jesus Christ said so. The Catholic Church doesn't forbid the change. God does. Now, these changes not only invalidate a sacrament, they create a new man-made church. I said certain words in a certain way. So let's talk about the words. The mystery of faith. Now, if you look up the Last Supper in the Gospels, you'll notice that the words of the consecration in the original Mass aren't quite the same as the Gospels, and that the Gospels themselves 
differ slightly from one to the next. Also, you note that Jesus doesn't say the mystery of faith at all. So what are we to conclude? Was the canon of the Mass written after the Gospels by lifting and then adding the mystery of faith? Well, it sort of looks like that. But you're forgetting something. The Bible is based on the Catholic Church, not the other way around. The New Testament is simply a part of church tradition, tradition reflecting uh, the first century of the church's existence. And it wasn't codified until 397 A.D. Written liturgies were in existence long before the Gospels. There's proof. Some of them were still in existence at the time of the Council of Trent. So the church predates the Bible, and so does the Mass. Jesus Christ instructed his apostles very carefully in how to say his Mass, and they followed his directions exactly, and they wrote it down so that they'd be sure they were doing it the right way. Now, the canon of the Mass isn't lifted from the Gospels. It predates the Gospels, and in a way, it's a fifth Gospel of its own. Or to put it another way, the canon of the original Catholic Mass is the closest thing we have to a tape recording of the words of Jesus Christ. It's closer to him historically than the Bible itself. And those are the words that the faithless clergy of Vatican II dared to change. By the way, the Novus Ordo ceremony, the new Mass, was written by Monsignor Annabali Bugnini with the assistance of six Protestant clergymen. Now, that's the truth. You surprised? You can look it up. Furthermore, a few years later, it was proven that Monsignor Bugnini was a Mason. You can also look that up. Now, think about that. The Vatican II Mass, the new Mass, the Novus Ordo, was written by six Protestant clergymen and a Monsignor, who was a Mason, all of this under the supervision of Paul VI. Now, if you don't know what a Mason is, um, a Mason is to the Catholic Church what the Sioux Indian Nation was to General Custer. And the Novus Ordo Mass was written by a Mason. Some Vatican II clergy like to claim that Pius V wrote the Tridentine Mass. Well, he didn't. Jesus Christ wrote it. But in 1570, Pope St. Pius V decreed that the Roman Missal, the true Catholic Mass, must remain unchanged in perpetuity forever. And that was in order to protect it from the false ceremonies of, of heretical reformers like Martin Luther, for example. Pope St. Pius V then decreed infallibly that anyone who dared to change the Mass would incur the wrath of Almighty God and Saints Peter and Paul his apostles. Well, I've dwelt on the destruction of the Mass as the key to the desecration of the Church, but the architects of Vatican II knew that all the sacraments had to be destroyed. So quickly, we're going to run through the rest of them, and I'll just kind of highlight this, but let's take baptism first. In the official document describing the new rite of baptism, only a single kind of passing reference is made to original sin. In fact, what the entire rite boils down to is just a an initiation into the Christian community. But this all raises some doubt as to the intent of the priest to remove original sin. Now, the sacrament of penance, it's not called penance anymore, it's called reconciliation, doesn't seem to, to be a confession of sin against God anymore, but more uh, a confession of offense against the community. Reconciliation is stressed over absolution, being forgiven for your sins. Um, you do get an absolution, but, but the important part of it seems to be kind of a, a pat on the back, telling you that you're one of us again, that you've now reconciled your differences with your fellow man. It, it really seems that the only sin is offending the community, and absolution just consists of reacceptance or reconciliation with that community. Now, that's all very nice, but it has very little to do 
with your relationship to God and the salvation of your soul through the expiation of sin by performing the proper penance after receiving absolution from a priest. Well, I've already talked about the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist in my discussion on the Mass. So let's just say that the new Eucharist is simply a memorial meal in which we offer a toast to our old friend Jesus. It's kind of like a testimonial dinner in honor of some local celebrity. You don't really need the details of that. You've seen all that for yourself. The sacrament of confirmation, well, the individual laying on of hands has been suppressed. Instead of the tap on the cheek signifying the acceptance of a soldier of Christ, um, there's just this welcome to the community handshake. You know how that word community keeps cropping up? We'll discuss that in a minute. Marriage. Well, here the form of the sacraments changed very little. But I don't see how we can say that the sacredness our Lord bestowed on matrimony when he said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, is being respected when Vatican II routinely sunders marriages like so much firewood. I'll give you a little statistic here. From 1952 to 1956, there were 392 annulments worldwide. In 1990 alone, there were 62,824. The Sacrament of Holy Orders. Now, the most important power bestowed on a priest at his ordination is the power to perform a consecration to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. This power is not given to a priest ordained in the Vatican II rites. He's just instructed to celebrate the liturgy. But then maybe that fits. The new liturgy isn't a mass. There's no sacrifice involved. So the Vatican II priest has no need of that power. He's just the one who presides over the gatherings, kind of like the chairman of a committee. In all likelihood, though, a Vatican II priest isn't a priest at all. He just doesn't have the power. Now, next to the destruction of the mass, I think the cruelest thing done to you and to me, the laity, is the removal of the sacrament of extreme unction. That's right. Extreme unction simply doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced by something called the anointing of the sick. Now, extreme unction is a final anointing when one is in danger of death. It prepares you to meet God face to face. It ushers you safely into his arms at the end of your life. Now, that's extreme unction. The anointing of the sick, on the other hand, is just a prayer that you'll soon feel better. It's to be administered to anyone who doesn't feel well, preferably in large groups, kind of a, a collective hallowing of hypochondriacs. <laughs> and why did I make a joke? It's not funny. The cruel reality is this. When you or I lay dying in our final extremity, pondering our sins and fearful of what God will think of us, when we meet him, face to face, and we cry out for the priest to bring us the peaceful reassurance of extreme unction, a last blessing, and our petition for final absolution as we go to meet our God face to face, what we would receive from the Vatican II Church is the spiritual equivalent of a get well card. I will talk very little more of the differences between the Roman Catholic Church and the post-conciliar Vatican II Church, which has replaced it. But you may be curious as to how and why the replacement was accomplished. Well, with hindsight, the how is really fairly simple. On January the 25th, 1959, John the 23rd had an inspiration. He said he wanted to open the doors and the windows of the church. Well, evidently he meant that he wanted to, to update the church, make it more relevant and ecumenical. I looked up the word ecumenical in my dictionary and I found three definitions. One, general, universal. Well, the word Catholic is synonymous with the word universal. How do you make something already universal more universal? Two, pertaining to the whole Christian church. The Catholic church is the whole Christian church. Any others professing Christianity are in error. Three, promoting or fostering Christian unity throughout the world. 
Well, the church has always done this through its missions and by standing always ready to take back any of its brethren who have strayed from the true path of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of puzzling. Ecumenical was already ecumenical. But now with the hindsight of 30 years, these things can be figured out. Had ecumenism been pursued as a project to return Protestants to the Catholic faith, well, that would have been a noble and a worthwhile goal, I think. But sadly, I'm going to quote from Major John S. Robertson. The fellow said in a letter to Homiletic and Pastoral Review, this August-September 1992 issue, Major John S. Robertson said in this letter, he said, ecumenism seemed to mean Catholics and Protestants sitting down to talk over what Catholics were not going to believe anymore. I like that. I have never heard the Vatican II ecumenical process better summed up. Step by step, the clergy decided that Catholics would believe less and less until now, Vatican II theology really seems to me to consist of do as you please and Jesus will probably love you for it. At any rate, as a result of his inspiration, John XXIII convened the Second Vatican Council on October 11, 1962, and it continued through December 8, 1965. Now, an awfully lot was discussed by over 2,000 bishops in over three years. The discussion on the nature of the church I believe, is what opened the doors to the resultant destruction, desecration. You see, the church is really a supernatural entity instituted by God himself. So it's in the world, but not of the world. I'm sure you've heard that phrase. Now, had the discussions of its nature been theological in their direction, then great spiritual insight might have been achieved. But Instead of spiritual discussions, the bishops indulged in a vain attempt to explain the Catholic Church in 20th century political terms. Now, that, that's like trying to explain the Holy Trinity in terms of multiple personality psychosis. Anyway, failing to come to any true understanding of the Catholic Church, the bishops of Vatican II decided to build their own church. And guess what? It turned out to be a political Christian social club. It's easy enough to understand but it's definitely not a Catholic church. Now, the discussions on the nature of the church made the, the, the destruction possible, but it was the conclusion on collegiality that made the dissolution so rapid. You realize how fast it is? I mean, the mass, the Novus Ordo Mass only came into existence in its present form about 22, 23 years ago. Uh, collegiality was just the question of who's in charge. Does the Pope rule the church with sole authority as an absolute monarch, or does he rule along with the College of Bishops? Is the Pope obligated to confer with the bishops before he makes a decision? Are the bishops a sort of a Congress that passes laws, which the Pope then enforces? If the, does the, if the Pope rules with the bishops, are the bishops infallible? Is the Pope infallible? I mean, they took up scads of questions like this. Well, the upshot of these discussions was a very confusing conclusion. And it went like this. This is a straight quote right out of the Vatican II documents, the Vatican II Constitution. Here's what they decided. Together with their head, the supreme pontiff, and never apart from him, they, meaning the bishops, have supreme and full authority over the universal church. Well, that statement is so ambiguous that it's open to either of two interpretations. One, the Pope rules alone. Or, two, the bishops are autonomous and they do as they please. Well, since there were 2,000 bishops and only one Paul VI, guess which interpretation carried the day? The bishops almost immediately began to do whatever they wanted. That's why the universality of the church, its consistency, was so rapidly lost. That's why you see so many variations, abuses, and, and, and theological inconsistencies in behavior and teachings from one diocese to the next, and also nowadays from one parish to the next in the Vatican II Church. But let's go on, get back to a brief history of the council itself, the council sessions themselves. When the council was called, you have to remember that, that by John the Twenty-Third, most of the bishops were puzzled. Now, a council was usually called when the church was in some sort of dire trouble, and, and no one could think what trouble there might be. So, most of them assumed 
that it'd be a fairly quick meeting, maybe uh, on procedural or administrative matters. As a consequence, the majority of the bishops were totally unprepared when the modernist minority launched an all-out attack on the very foundations of the church itself. Now, the modernists were well prepared. Now, I say they were a minority because as a percentage, they were really few, maybe 20%. But 20% of 2,000 is 400. There were more than enough to accomplish their task. By skillful preparation and with the assistance of John the Twenty-Third, they were able to pack the various committees and groups that decided what would be discussed. So they were successful in seeing to it that almost everything pertaining to the church was thrown open to debate. In other words, they skillfully sowed the seeds of doubt. Now, doubt's always the first element in loss of faith, isn't it? But once this was accomplished, it was an easy step to gaining control of the council itself as to who would speak, uh, what would be said by the speakers, uh, who would write the various opinions, uh, the position papers, and so forth. In short, a well-prepared minority with clearly defined goals was successful in manipulating a poorly prepared majority most of whom never did seem to understand what the council was all about. Any politician will quickly uh, recognize that. It's a classical political technique. Now, that's a very simplified description of how the modernists succeeded in dominating the Second Vatican Council. It's simple, but it is accurate. Now, why was it done? Well, actually, there are several whys to be answered. Now, remember something. In the end, almost all of the bishops bowed to the will of the modernists. But don't forget this. It's important to the answer to the first why. Why did the majority go along with this? Well, quite simply, and I think kind of obviously, they lost their faith. Through long usage, the mass had become almost meaningless to many of them. So when someone said, well, look, the, the liturgy's only words won't hurt to change it, they were susceptible. Through long toil in a world torn by two hideous world wars and, and, and sorely punished by the famine of the Great Depression and beset by the evils of totalitarianism, when someone said, look, let's, let's forget all this mumbo-jumbo about the real presence, the sacraments, sanctifying grace, all that spiritual stuff. Let's make the church socially relevant by stressing its worldly responsibilities. The bishops... The Church Fathers of Vatican II showed a remarkable lack of Catholic faith. The big why to me, though, is why the modernists in the first place? Where did these guys come from? Now, the answer, I think, is in two parts. And the first part's simple. Modernism, or heresy, is easier. The errors of all the reformers have always been glossed over with high-sounding theological argument. But always at bottom... It's the fact that the erroneous change makes it easier. It's easier to say Jesus saved us all automatically than to make our own sacrifice, take up our own cross, and follow him. So, it's easier to welcome someone into the Christian community than it is to help them renounce Satan and cleanse their soul of original sin. It's easier to preside over a group reconciliation than to absolve a soul in torment by listening to his sins. It's easier to preside over a memorial meal than to take responsibility for changing bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And it's easier to pray for the sick than it is to take responsibility for the transition of a human soul from this world to the next. So, modernism, heresy, Satan always tells us it's easy if we'll just abandon Jesus Christ. The second part of the answer is more difficult because it, it has to do with the social development of the 20th century modernists who suborned Vatican II. Now, only Catholic doctrine clearly illuminates Christianity. And Christianity is an individual religion. It, Jesus Christ speaks mostly just to individuals. He didn't say, all of you pick up one cross. He said, take up your cross. Whenever God speaks, 
He speaks to individuals. Now, Jesus may be addressing a multitude, but his words penetrate to each individual soul. We go to communion one at a time and receive the resulting graces one at a time. The shepherd goes off to find the one sheep that was lost. Now, you might disagree with some of what I've said, so go ahead. Get out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I did that. I looked through them. And you know, it's hard to find anywhere that Jesus Christ places any importance on groups at all. And I think that's understandable. After all, he's God. And to God, there is no human race. There is no group soul. There's only each individual soul, and he treats us individually. Furthermore, he expects us to respond to him in the same way. Now, don't misunderstand me. Of course, there's a Christian community, and of course, it's important. But don't forget, it's made up of individuals. Oh, by the way, modernism, I should define that for you. I'm using that word and haven't defined it. Modernism is just a collection of old heresies. Arianism, Lutheranism, Calvinism. But the 20th century modernist added a new ism. We call it collectivism. The modernists of Vatican II were exposed, as were many people in their early years, to collectivist thought through the political agencies of communism and socialism. Now, these political systems elevate the group above the individual. In extreme forms, they attempt to abolish individual thought completely in favor of group action only. Now, I have to say action. Groups don't think. So the modernists are socially collectivist in thought. The church is totally individual in its theology. Now think about that. From the modernist point of view, in order to make the church socially relevant, then its spiritual individualism had to be destroyed. And this is where all that community emphasis that we see in the Vatican II church is coming from. They've reversed the theology. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said, Love the Lord thy God, and the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor. Vatican II very neatly reverses this. Essentially, Vatican II Catholics are being told that God can't even be approached unless they first fulfill the second commandment to love each other. Well, that's not only heresy. It's worse than heresy. It's impossible doesn't work that way. And I'll give you a little homely example here, all right? If you and I sat down together over a beer or a cup of coffee, well, we might like each other or we might not. Now, in fact, we might take an instant dislike to each other, in which case we would go away from our meeting having failed to fulfill the second commandment. But if we first love God, know God, then hopefully we have the the necessary grace to overlook one another's failings, to overlook one another's faults, and see that, that we're both individuals who love God and who God loves, and therefore we should be able to love each other. That's a simple example. But you see what I mean? And think about it. It really doesn't work the other way around. At any rate, the church had to be made collectivist in order to fulfill this modernist desire for what they called social relevance. And that's still being done today. But now you come to another why, don't you? Why this emphasis on community? Why this abandonment of individual soul and mind to the group ethic? What's the advantage to the modernists? Well, I think the advantage is control. You see, it's hard to control a group of individuals. But it's fairly easy to manipulate a mindless mob. Now, now think about this. What always happens in a society where the individual conscience is abandoned to the group ethic? Now, I shouldn't have to tell you. We've had plenty of examples in the poor old 20th century, but I'll tell you anyway, because I want to make this really clear. Once the group has abandoned its individuality, then it's easy for one individual to step forward and dominate that group. Totalitarianism is the result. And the inevitable end of totalitarianism is famine, pestilence, death. Now, what happens when this kind of thought 
is applied to a religious group in a religious setting? What's the result of the abandonment of the individual mind and soul to the dictates of group morality in a theological setting? Well, one charismatic leader always seems to pop up. He assumes total moral control, and what do you have? A cult. Now, we've got some recent examples of what can happen then, don't we? Remember Jim Jones? He told his followers, don't listen to Jesus Christ, listen to me. Well, the last thing he told them to do was kill themselves, and by golly, they did. About 800 men, women, and children drank Kool-Aid laced with cyanide in what has now come to be called the Guyana tragedy. That was many years ago, but I bet a lot of you remember it. Now, I'm not saying the Vatican II Church is a cult. Not yet. But this constant repression of the individual soul's relationship with God in favor of the individual body's relationship with his fellow man, that constant pressure to abandon the individual soul and mind to the dominance of group social interaction makes it cult-like in nature. And I don't like it. So, what is it? The Vatican II Church. Well, it's definitely not Catholic. Now, that much is obvious. Is it Protestant? Well, I've used Protestant comparisons and examples for ease of illustration, but uh, that would be too easy. The easy definition would be to say, well, it's Protestant, let it go at that. But I think the Vatican II Church has moved so far away from Catholicism in so many ways, and it's continuing to move away from Catholicism, I think eventually it's not even going to resemble erroneous Christianity. And as it continues to move farther and farther away from Jesus Christ, I think it eventually won't even be recognizable as Christian at all. So now you know. The Vatican II Church is not Catholic. And now you have a fair idea of how and why this uh, false church was built. This tape is truthful. What I have spoken on it is backed up by the words of Jesus Christ, the apostles, 2,000 years of Catholic doctrine, and the writings of every Catholic theologian from St. Thomas Aquinas to Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. Vatican II is the wrong mass the wrong sacraments, and therefore the wrong church. So, if that little niggling piece of discomfort that caused you to begin watching this tape in the first place has now become serious concern for your soul, you have a problem, don't you? Well, actually, the, the problem is in just a few questions and, and contradictions that, that we need to resolve. Um, Maybe you feel now that it's spiritually unhealthy for you to attend the Vatican II Mass, but as a Catholic, you're obligated to attend Mass every Sunday. So what are you going to do? That's one problem, isn't it? It looks like a choice between obedience to Vatican II heresy on one side and your Catholic conscience and your knowledge of true Catholic doctrine on the other. So which way saves your soul? Obedience to heresy? or obedience to the Catholic Church. Well, obviously, as a Catholic, you want to obey the teachings of the Church. <laughs> it's just that it's a little difficult to find the Church, isn't it, when we're stumbling around in the murky aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. So, let's see if we can shed a little light. Uh, I'll begin with a short history of the Latin Mass since Vatican II. Now, when Paul VI decreed in 1970 that the Novus Ordo Missae, or the New Order of Mass, was to be said in all Catholic churches from then on, he also ordered that the Latin Mass, the Perpetual Mass, would not be said at all anywhere, anytime, by anybody. He banned the Latin Mass completely, with only one exception. Aged, retired priests were allowed to say it in private only, with no one in attendance. Well, there were a few, a relative handful of priests and bishops who refused to say the new Mass, and they continued to say the Latin Mass in defiance of Paul VI's instructions. Well, there ensued an ecclesiastical running gun battle between these faithful clergy and Paul VI for the next 14 years. Now, the Vatican II clergy misled many sincere and trusting Catholics at that time by claiming that the traditional Mass was illegal 
or that it didn't fulfill the Sunday obligation. They even uh, claimed that attending the true Mass was schismatic and disobedient. Many of them still make that claim today. And let me tell you, it is not true. I hate that. These times are difficult enough without having clergy who ought to know better spreading misinformation among faithful Catholics who are already troubled enough. Finally, after 14 years of this, with much foot dragging, John Paul II lifted the ban on the Latin Mass. Now, you see the most significant thing about this uh, little history of the Latin Mass? Don't ever forget this. The Latin Mass, the true Mass, the perpetual Mass, survived a concentrated 14-year effort by Paul VI and John Paul II to eradicate it, to stamp it out completely. It survived. It's evidently not only perpetual, it's indestructible. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't attend it or that it's invalid or that you're disobedient when you worship at the perpetual Mass. Now, I just said that John Paul II lifted the ban on the Latin Mass, so you may well be asking yourself, well, so where is it? Why isn't it said in your church? Well, when John Paul lifted the ban, he didn't do it by ordering priests and bishops to say it, and obviously he didn't ban the Novus Ordo Mass. What he did was publish an indult. Now, this was just simply a permission for the Latin Mass to be said, to be celebrated, if it was requested by the laity. The indult said that if the laity requests a Latin Mass, then the bishop must provide one. Well, guess what? In practice, the bishops simply don't give their permission. In the United States, they routinely turn down petitions bearing hundreds, sometimes thousands of signatures. So the so-called indult Mass is, is kind of a myth. It doesn't really exist. And even when it does, there are problems with it. In the instructions for its performance, for example, it's clearly stated that in his homily, in his sermon, the priest must state that the Novus Ordo Mass is just as valid. So, frankly, in my opinion, you still get heresy rammed down your throat. And furthermore, if the Mass is said in a Vatican II church, the host may have been consecrated in a Novus Ordo ceremony. So you're not going to communion in that case. You're just eating a piece of bread. So let me just say this. The adult Mass just isn't good enough. So your only certainty is a Latin Mass said by a priest who has no connection with Vatican II and who was ordained in the rite of holy orders as it was prior to Vatican II. Now, your Vatican II pastor may claim that a traditional priest isn't a real priest because he's not connected with the church. Well, a traditional priest is very well connected with the Catholic Church. He's just not connected with the heresy of Vatican II. A properly ordained priest is a priest forever. His power to perform the sacrifice of the Mass cannot be taken away, and you attend a valid Mass and obtain all the graces thereby any time you attend the Latin Mass said by a properly ordained priest. Now, if you pursue argument on this topic with a member of the Vatican II clergy, if you continue to bombard him with doctrine and truth and logic, he will eventually fall back on his last line of defense. He'll probably tell you that even if all you say is true, even if the Vatican II Church is not a Catholic Church anymore, you still must obey its dictates because the Pope approves it, and you must obey the Pope because you are a Catholic and the Pope is infallible. Let's examine that, shall we? Now, to examine that little last line of defense... We've got to consider the popes of Vatican II. John the Twenty-Third said he wanted to open the doors and the windows, but that is not what he did. What he did was start a new church. He spoke heresy at the very beginning. No one noticed it, but he spoke it. In his opening remarks at the first session of Vatican II, he said, this is a direct quote, the substance of the ancient doctrine contained in the deposit of the faith is one thing, the manner in which it is expressed is another. That, my friends, is heresy. Jesus Christ and his message are one and the same. And so his church is likewise one complete entity. The deposit of faith and its expression are inseparable. If the expression is changed, 
you have created a new church. That's what all the reformers did. Changed the expression and new church. John the 23rd continued his heresies as he planned the new liturgy and promoted the destruction of the sacraments. He conceived and committed heresy. Paul VI continued the heresies of John, most notably with his replacement of the perpetual mass with the Novus Ordo abomination, the said abomination written, remember, by Paul VI with the assistance of a mason and six Protestants. John Paul I didn't really live long enough to do much at all, but he did live long enough to make it clear in his writings that he intended to continue the apostasy started by John and Paul and John Paul II. He breaks my heart. I admire and respect him. I even love him. I think his goodness is obvious. I think he deserves a Congressional Medal for his contribution to the downfall of Russian totalitarianism. I believe he's truly concerned about the physical welfare of the human race. I think he's made heroic efforts to spread goodwill throughout the world. But what I think of John Paul's good works is immaterial to what I am forced to believe of his spiritual behavior. He has participated in pagan ceremonies. He worshipped at the shrine of Siva in India, being smeared with cow dung and ashes in the process, professing belief in the false pagan deity. He has participated in Protestant, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, and many, many pagan ceremonies. But put that all aside. Worst of all, he has done nothing to reverse or repair the depredations of Vatican II. You know, there's a, there's a popular misconception among faithful clergy and laity who still remain painfully in their Vatican II church, knowing that it's wrong. They have this misconception that John Paul is somehow a prisoner of his own hierarchy, that somehow a collection of evil bishops are between him and his faithful flock, preventing John Paul from correcting the heresies of Vatican II and, and rescuing the flock from the fires of hell. And sadly, I have to tell you, that's a cruel myth. It's concocted out of our affection for his obvious kindness and goodwill. All of the solid evidence shows that he approves the conciliar apostasy and he is much more concerned for human bodies than he is for human souls. And that is a hideous error. Our first concern must always be the salvation of our souls and it should also be his first concern. So, the heresy of four popes in a row is obvious, but they're infallible, right? Well, how can an infallible pope commit heresy? Well, let's talk about infallibility. You may have heard it said, and it's true, that the pope cannot err when he speaks officially on matters of faith and morals to the universal church using his supreme apostolic authority. Well, what's the faith? Simply put, faith is the church. Now, Jesus Christ built his church on the rock of Peter, the first pope. He didn't build it on the man, Simon. That Simon was Peter's given name, if you remember. He built it on Peter, the first pope. Now, why do you suppose he did that? Why did he, at the same moment, in the same breath with which he gave life to his church, also change Simon's name to Peter. Now, you remember that. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The keys to the kingdom, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. You remember that. Well, he did that all in one instant that way, partly to show that Peter's different. He's more than Simon. He is the Pope, the vicar of Christ on earth. But he also did it at that moment to show that Peter is inextricably bound to and part of that church. Why else institute the church and the papacy at one instant? To show that they are one. And therefore, the Pope is indeed infallible within the framework of the church 
because they're one and the same creation. But what about Simon, the big fisherman, the uncomplicated man who loves his friend Jesus? He didn't go away. He's still there. And he can err. And a few moments later, he does. Referring to our Lord's prediction of crucifixion, Simon Peter says, This shall not be so. No, that's not a question. It's a statement. Simon Peter is attempting to change the nature of the church by ordering God himself to retreat from the crucifixion. And remember, this happens about five minutes after thou art Peter. What does Jesus say to Simon? He says, get thee behind me, Satan. A pope changing the nature of the church and inventing a new one is not a matter of infallibility or even ability. It's an impossibility because God does not allow it. He made it impossible in the way he created the church and the papacy. The name says it all. Satan, not Simon, not Simon Peter or Peter, but Satan. Satan is not a pope. So God himself says to Peter, if you would change my church, you are not a pope. Now, he said this to poor Peter just for making one little verbal suggestion. Now, what of Angelo Roncalli, Giovanni Montini, Albino Luciani, and Caro Votilla, who have built their own church? Think of the church as a building with the Pope imprisoned in it by God. The Pope cannot leave it. But Angelo Roncalli could and did. He didn't open the doors. He went out the door, leaving his papacy behind. He laid the foundations of a new church. Giovanni Montini followed out that same door to build that man-made church, not Pope-made, man-made. And Albino Luciani went out the door, but he dropped dead on the way to the new church. And Carol Rotillo also left, and he's furnished the apostate church of Angelo Roncalli and Giovanni Montini with blasphemy and sacrilege. When a man who has been elected to the office of Pope abandons the church, he leaves his papacy behind. It is vacant. There is no Pope. Not because I say so, or theologians say so, but because Jesus Christ clearly said so. He is God. Now, he foresaw this time, and he gave us a comforting promise to go with it. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> that promise has been misunderstood, I think, as it applies to Vatican II. And that misunderstanding is what imprisons many otherwise faithful Catholics in their Vatican II churches. I think many of them fear that if they accept the evidence of their eyes and ears and admit that the Vatican II Church isn't Catholic, well, then that means that the gates of hell have prevailed against it. Well, come on. Have a little faith. That's a promise direct from God. He doesn't break his promises. The gates of hell certainly are prevailing and opening for those faithless Catholics who have joyfully embraced the apostasy of Vatican II. But those faithful Catholics who live in the arms of the church at the altar of the Holy Mass are proof that the gates of hell have not prevailed. The only reason the apostate conciliar church still survives is that too few Catholics are aware of the fact that the leaders of that church have no authority. They're only men in a man-made church. Our statistics show that it's already come crumbling, falling apart. So... Let's catch our breath for a minute. I've just said shocking things. But think about it. You've got to admit, a vacant papacy is the only logical answer to that question that's been driving you crazy. It's been bothering you. How can a pope be a heretic? The answer is so simple, he didn't notice it. The answer is really simple. He can't be. If he's a heretic, he's not a pope. The other question, of course, is how can the Catholic Church practice and teach heresy? Well, it can't. If it does, it's not a Catholic church. So, now, let's suppose you reject everything I've said. You believe that the Vatican II church is Catholic. Well, 
Let me offer you some of those statistics I mentioned. You may have heard, uh, by their fruits, you shall know them. I want to read you some of the fruits of Vatican II. During the last 20 years, about 100,000 priests left the priesthood. The number of seminarians has dropped from 48,000 in 1965 to 1,300 in mid-1988. The number of nuns in the United States from 1964 to 1992 declined by over 82,000. The number of converts in the United States from 1960 to 1989 declined by almost 64,000. Infant baptisms in the United States, 1960 to 1985, dropped over 360,000. The National Catholic Education Association said that from 1965 to 1978, the nation's Catholic schools lost more than 2 million students and closed over 3,600 schools. Catholic marriages declined by 100,000 since 1971. hate this one, the abortion rate among Catholic women runs 30% higher than it does among Protestant women. And worst of all, Catholics are running away in droves. Hundreds of thousands of Roman Catholics leave the churches all the day. About About 150 people a day leave the church. The church estimates that it's lost about 5 million Hispanic Catholics alone since 1980. So, those are the fruits of Vatican II. Now, let's suppose further, you distrust statistics. All right, don't listen to me. Distrust my statistics. Discard them out of hand if you want to. Just open your eyes and look around, though. Is the church better than it was prior to Vatican II, or is it worse? Is the world better or worse? I'll tell you something. In 1960, Angelo Roncalli, John the Twenty-Third, opened the Third Secret of Fatima, and he said something like, "It does not concern my papacy." He tossed it back in its drawer, and he proceeded with the Second Vatican Council. Open your eyes. Look around. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, famine, pestilence, war, and death, well, they've saddled up many times in our poor old 20th century. And it appears to me that their latest ride, which is still continuing, began in about 1960. I find it very interesting that the moral and economic decline of our civilization that we're watching right now appears to be coincidental with the conception, execution, and proliferation of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. It's really all I have to say. It occurs to me that you might like to know where I am. Uh, This is Queen of Angels Catholic Church in Newhall, California. It's small, but we're growing very rapidly as more and more Catholics leave their Vatican II parishes. It also occurs to me that some of you might have questions, comments, (laughs) or curses for me. In all three cases, I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say. So I'm going to do something that I think is more or less unprecedented in the history of informational tapes like this. I'm going to give you my home phone number. My name's Richard Jameson. You can reach me at 818-886-6483. Give me a call. Thanks for your time. The Vatican II Church, which fraudulently continues to represent itself as Catholic, is rapidly self-destructing. However, the one holy Catholic apostolic church instituted almost 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ continues as always to thrive, even though it's smaller these days. It's kept alive and growing through the celebration of the true Mass 
and it is by finding this mass that you will find the church. Check the religion section of your local newspaper for traditional, Latin, or Tridentine mass locations to find the Catholic church nearest you. If you don't find one listed, give me a call. Maybe I can help.